Hi, good morning, everybody, and very welcome. We are busy um, uh, broadcasting live here from the Family Medicine Boardroom at Cecilia Makiwani Hospital um, for our monthly Funda Friday contribution to, to this excellent um, um, Eastern Cape District uh, program that we have. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing specifically on HIV and renal disease because there has been some um, amazing developments um, around both the medicines available as well as the dosing of, of drugs for patients with renal disease. And we thought it important just to make sure that everybody is updated. So I would like to um, introduce Dr. Smith, who is one of the interns here um, at Family Medicine and who will be taking us through this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, please remember to add your names and your um, professional numbers in the chat for CPD purposes. Okay, hi, um, as Dr. Miller said, I am Dina Ray Smith, um, and I'm going to be presenting um, on HIV and renal disease today. Um, we have three cases that we're going to discuss, and um, that is going to help us go through a lot of the important points when it comes to um, management of patients with HIV and renal disease. <coughs> Okay, so our outline for today, our first case that we're going to speak about is going to focus on renal impairment in patients who are not virally suppressed. Our second case is going to be about renal impairment after initiating ART. And our third case is going to look into managing HIV in the context of chronic kidney disease. So our first case, we have a 25-year-old male who defaulted his ARVs three years ago. He has a BMI of 19 and is presenting with itchy papules on his arms and chest, but is otherwise well. On urine dipstick, he noted three plus protein. The patient is keen to restart his ARVs as he's embarrassed about his rash. So we have some considerations to think about. And um, this uh, three plus protein urea is significant and it is suggestive of kidney dysfunction. So the question now is, should we start TLD today? Is it safe to do that without knowing the renal function? Um, in the South African HIV guidelines, there is no indication to screen for renal disease, even with a dipstick before initiating treatment. Um, and suspected renal disease based on a dipstick is not listed as one of the indications to delay ARV initiation. So you wouldn't be wrong to start the ARVs on this first day. However, you also would not be wrong to delay initiation if you'd rather um, wait for renal function results. You need to look at it on a case-to-case -case basis and decide according to how the patient presents. Um, so you, first of all, you di diagnose papular pyritic eruption in this patient, which is a common skin manifestation in HIV that you can see in the picture here. Um, and due to the protein in the urine, you decide not to restart treatment today. You take baseline bloods, you send a sputum for expert, and um, you bring him back in one week to review the results. So let's have a look at those results. So we had a HB of 9.6, which is on the low side, um, a CD4 of 185, the hep B surface antigen, the RPR, and the gene expert were all negative. And then the creatinine came back as raised, 175. The EGFR from the two formulas came back as 53 and 47.2. So his blood results show us that he has some renal impairment. So what should you do now? We're going to use this case to cover some ground about how to approach a patient who is HIV positive with renal impairment who is not virally suppressed. That's either someone who's not yet on treatment or it's someone who's not controlled on their treatment. So what could be causing it and how do we manage it? Firstly, we quickly need to pause and understand the parameters that we use to measure renal function. One of the major functions of the kidneys is filtration, as you can see depicted in this picture. So we measure kidney function by assessing its filtration rate. This cannot be done directly, but the most practical way is to use an endogenous filtration marker to estimate the EGFR. Or well, in simpler terms, it means we measure something that our body produces and that gets filtered out through the kidneys. The first one is creatinine. It's the most widely used. Creatinine comes from metabolism of creatine in our skeletal muscle and from dietary meat. It's a relatively good marker because it's freely filtered, it's produced in a relatively consistent way, and there's minimal secretion and it's not reabsorbed. However, using creatinine alone is not the most reliable because um, creatinine value is also affected by non-renal factors, especially muscle mass. 
So this value varies depending on age, weight, body habitus, and even um, food consumption. So there are a couple of formulas that have been created to try and take into account these variables um, with serum creatinine. Um, and this is the estimated EGFR. There's a few different formulas. The initial one used um, is the cockroft galt formula. This uses sex, age, weight, and creatinine to um, get the EGFR. It's relatively easy to calculate, and because it takes weight into account, it's often more accurate in patients who are wasted, and that's common. We commonly see that in advanced HIV disease. Um, but because it uses weight, it's also not something that can be automatically generated from our NHLS lab results. And um, the next two are ones that you will typically see on your NHLS results. The first being the MDRD formula. Um, it's the formula that's currently being used in the HIV guidelines. It takes into account sex and age, but it was initially formulated on a population that was studied that had CKD versus the CKD EPI formula, which also takes into account age and sex, but was studied on a population of people with and without CKD. And it's shown to be more accurate in the studies that have been done um, at picking up mild renal impairment. So that is why we should be using the EPI formula. So this is the table um, on renal function that's from the latest HIV treatment guidelines. And there's just a few things that I wanted us to note. Firstly, as you can see in the middle there, um, they are still using the MDRD equation, but as I mentioned, the studies have shown that the EPI is more accurate, and so we should move towards using that instead. The next is that we should be using a different formula when we are calculating EGFR for children. Um, you can see the age ranges here, and we should be using that formula on the right. It takes into account height as well and creatinine. And then lastly, in pregnant women, we should be using the absolute creatinine level instead of the EGFR because pregnancy itself can lead to an increase in EGFR. So now back to our case, um, what could be causing this renal impairment? The first question that we should be asking is, is this acute kidney injury or could this be chronic kidney disease? So we need to then just revise some of our definitions. So these are the definitions of AKI and CKD by K to go. So an AKI is defined by increase in serum creatinine equal to a more than 26.5 within 48 hours, or an increase in serum creatinine more than 1.5 times the baseline, which is known or presumed to have occurred in the last seven days, or a urine volume less than 0.5 mils per kg per hour for six hours. Um, and then chronic kidney disease is defined by abnormalities of kidney structure or function uh, present for more than three months, as shown by either an EGFR of less than 60 or a persistent albuminuria more than three milligrams per millimole. Those are the two we use the most commonly, but it can also be defined by structural abnormalities seen in imaging, pathological abnormalities seen in histology or urine sediments. So um, now when we take our history and exam for this patient, we need to be keeping in mind the possible causes. So here's just a brief overview. For acute kidney injury, we typically speak about um, pre-renal, intrinsic, or obstructive um, causes. Pre-renal can essentially be anything that causes um, a low circulating volume or dehydration, and anything that causes restrict blood flow, restricted blood flow to the kidney. So some examples of this are decreased oral intake, vomiting or diarrhea, um, over diuresis, maybe a low kidney perfusion, perfusion pressure, like in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, vasoconstriction by NSAIDs, um, and inhibition of the RAS blockade. Um, then some intrinsic causes, it's anything that damages the kidney itself, so that can be damage to the glomeruli, the tubules, the interstitium, and then obstructive uropathy, um, which is blockage of the outflow tract. Um, commonly caused by prostatic disease or intra-abdominal malignancies. Um, then for CKD, important to note that any acute kidney injury, if sufficiently severe or long-standing, can lead to um, persistently abnormal kidney function and therefore chronic kidney disease. Um, there's uh, multiple ways that you can uh, sort of break down the possible causes of chronic kidney disease. This is just an example. You can divide them into vascular, for example, hypertension, Glomerular disease, which can be caused by diabetes, autoimmune diseases, drugs, and systemic infections. And to note here, this includes HIV. 
um, tubular interstitial diseases, which can also be from drug toxicity, and then structural causes like polycystic kidneys or renal artery stenosis. So now we go on to investigating the cause. And as mentioned now with the causes, the investigating doesn't just start with the blood test and the urine test. It starts with taking a good history and exam. So some of the things you should be looking out for are, are there any causes of dehydration that are possible? Is the patient vomiting? Do they have diarrhea? Are they maybe on high doses of diuretics? You can also inquire about any lower urinary tract symptoms. On your past medical history, you should find out about their comorbidities and are they controlled? So this includes HIV, diabetes, hypertension, um, heart failure, autoimmune diseases. It's also important to get a medication history to ensure they're not taking any nephrotoxic medications um, and also to see if you need to dose adjust any of those medications. And then importantly, you should try and look back into old records of renal function for these patients to help assess if the renal function can immediately be classed as um, acute or chronic based on that. Um, on examination, important to get your vitals, including a urine dipstick. You're looking for hypertension, hypotension, maybe if they're severely dehydrated. On the dipstick, you're looking for hematuria, proteinuria, or UTI. Um, you should also be assessing your fluid status and looking for any signs of systemic disease. So based on this, if you're suspecting an acute kidney injury, you can correct the correctables, um, encourage fluids, stop nephrotoxins, and monitor the renal function by repeating your, um, your cusp and checking your EGFR. But if you're suspecting now a CKD, you can look more towards doing other investigations such as an a, uh, HB and a CMP. In CKD, you might get a low HB and for example, a high phosphate due to um, decline in the renal function that plays a role in your um, erythropoietin and your filtering out of your phosphate. Um, you can also do a urine PCR to quantify your protein urea. Um, a KUB ultrasound is also useful if it's available. It can identify structural abnormalities, hydronephrosis, and it also can assess the kidney size. Smaller kidneys, less than nine centimeters, suggest CKD. Um, so if we think about our case, um, we didn't find much on history or exam to suggest an AKI. So we went on to do some investigations for him. So as you can see here, um, his HB, as we saw before, was a little bit low, 9.6. His calcium was also slightly low, 2.15, had a normal magnesium and phosphate level. Um, and then the UPCR came back as 0.031 grams per millimole, which is raised. I'm going to take this time just to pause and talk a little bit about um, the UPCR. So... Um, KDGO guidelines recommend that we use a urine albumin creatinine ratio as it's more specific to glomerular protein loss versus protein creatinine ratio, which can represent a broader spectrum of kidney injury. But uh, protein creatinine ratio is what we have access to, and so it's what we will be speaking about. Um, here you can see how we classify the severity of the increase in albumin or proteinuria into mild, moderate, and severe. It's important to note that on NHLS, when you get your urine PCR, it will be reported in grams per millimole. And so you need to um, correct the units if you're going to interpret it based on um, KDGO guidelines. And so here, for example, our patient, it was, um, he had a UPCR of 0 0.031 grams per millimole. So we need to multiply by that, that by 1,000, which gives us 31 milligrams per millimole, um, which would fall under the moderately increased um, section in the UPCR. Um, also, um, just to note, nephrotic range protein area is defined as more than 30 milligrams per millimole. Um, based on this patient's history and the UPCR results, um, it's very important to consider HIV-related kidney disease as he's not virally suppressed. So we're going to go on now to briefly discuss um, some of those conditions. So the first one is high van. So high van is HIV associated nephropathy. This is a collapsing form of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Um, it causes tubular dilation and interstitial inflammation within the kidney. And it's thought to be due to the infection of renal epithelial cells by the virus itself. Um, so who is typically um, more at risk for high van? It's usually patients with advanced HIV disease. 
but it can occur at a, um, acute zero conversion. It's strongly associated as well um, with people of African an ancestry, um, and it's suspected to be due to a specific gene polymorphism. So the clinical picture, as mentioned, is usually um, patients with advanced HIV disease. So this is patients who aren't virally suppressed, their CD4 is maybe less than 200, um, and they have a history of treatment interruption, as for in our case. Um, they also are likely to have nephrotic range proteinuria, a rapid decline in kidney function, and can be associated with hypertension, hematuria, and edema. Um, diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis is on renal biopsy, but in our context, this is, can be quite difficult to access. Some other investigations you can do if you suspect high band include a UPCR to quantify your protein area. You can also do an abdominal ultrasound, which typically shows normal or large kidneys with increased epigenicity. So management is just initiating ART as soon as possible. If they have associated hypertension or significant protein area, they should be started on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And if not controlled, you can consider an SGL2 inhibitor, which we don't have access to in public currently. Um, just to note, there are no randomized um, trials on ROS inhibitors and SGL2 inhibitors for the treatment specifically of high band. But based on the small studies that have been done and their favorable profile, evidence and the evidence that supports their use in other forms of CKD, it is still recommended as um, treatment for high band. There's also no role for routine steroid use currently. Um, although there have been some small studies that suggest um, steroid therapy can improve your kidney function and reduce proteinuria, these studies were done before the introduction of effective um, ART and adverse events were common. So we currently just do that on a case-to-case -case basis. So now on to HIVIC. So HIVIC is HIV-associated immune complex kidney disease. Um, it's a very broad term encompassing a host of different immune-mediated mechanisms and patterns, and the caudality is poorly understood. Um, experts are starting to discourage the use of this term and move towards classi classifying them according to their histological pattern. Um, but this term still serves useful because we don't always have access to histology results. And um, so what it is, is as I mentioned, it's immune complex mediated. The different histological lesions can be IgA or lupus-like syndrome. So uh, HIVAC is less common than HIVAN, and unlike HIVAN, it's usually in patients who are receiving um, ART therapy, they're virally suppressed, and they have a CD4 count of more than 200. Their clinical picture is variable and can have microhematuria, proteinuria, and impaired renal function. Diagnosis is um, renal biopsy, and management is recommended to be based on the histological lesion on biopsy, which, as you can imagine, proves difficult when we have um, little access to that. So now how do we move forward? We should be addressing any reversible causes, and so that's encouraging fluid intake and stopping any nephrotoxic drugs. We should initiate ART as soon as possible in this patient, ensure there are indications for renal replacement therapy like acidosis, refractory hyperkalemia, and uremia complications, and we should be monitoring with a monthly cusp and urine PCR in three months. So this now comes into play when choosing what ART we're going to start him on because um, tenofovir is known to be a nephrotoxic drug. So let's chat quickly about choosing our ART based on our EGFR. So if your EGFR is decreased, so it's less than 60, but it's still above 50, we don't actually need to dose adjust. We can use our normal first line therapy, which is a fixed dose combination of TLD, tenofovir, lamivudine, and zolitegravir. When the EGFR gets below 50, we need to stop tenofovir because tenofovir is excreted by the kidneys and can cause nephrotoxicity. We change this to um, abacava, which doesn't require any dose adjustments. It was previously thought that abacava was less effective than tenofovir, especially at high viral loads, but studies have shown that they show equal reduction in viral load. Um, another alternative for TDF is TAF, which is just an alternative formulation to tenofovir. Um, but in public, we don't have access to it as a fixed dose combination. And it's also associated with excessive weight gain and adverse lipid profile. Um, when our EGFR starts decreasing, we also need to consider um, adjusting our lamivudine dose. When the EGFR is between 30 and 50, there's still good evidence that you can use um, lamivudine at the current dose of 300. 
and you don't need to dose adjust, which means we can give the fixed dose combination that we now have access to, which is ALD, Abacavir, Lamivudine, and Dolutegravir. Now, once our EGFR is below 30, to, um, Lamivudine dose does need to change. We half the dose, and this means that we unfortunately can no longer use our fixed dose combination. Um, in theory, when the EGFR goes below 15, um, this dose of lamivudine might need to be further reduced. But experts are still recommending using that same 150 milligrams for anything below um, 30, as it's the lowest tablet dose that we have available. Below this, you need to get a liquid formulation. Um, and because of its favorable safety profile and the lack of um, data showing lamivudine toxicity that's dose related, they suggest continuing with the, the 150 milligrams. Also, just a quick note on um, Bactrim dosing changes. So when your EGFR is between 10 and 50, you give half the dose of 480. Um, and then if the, the EGFR is below 10, then you give that same half dose, but you only give it three times a week, not every day. Also, just a quick note on dolutegravir. Dolutegravir inhibits um, creatinine secretion, but it doesn't affect your renal function. You can um, expect a rise in creatinine after starting dolutegravir, but it's usually less than 25%, and it occurs in the first few weeks. If you see a rise more than 25%, and it occurs later in, or it occurs later in um, treatment, you should investigate for alternative causes. So um, based on our patient who had an EGFR of 47.2, we would start him on ALD fixed dose combination. And because the CD4 was less than 200, we would also need to start him on Bactrim. And because of the EGFR, we would start him on the half dose daily. Okay, so moving on to our second case. We have a 36-year-old woman who was started on TLD three months ago. She weighs 68 kgs, her baseline creatinine was 98, and her EGFR was 75 mls per minute. Um, at her three-month visit, her creatinine has now increased to 168, and her EGFR is 44. Her urine dip dipstick was NAD. So this case will help us um, to look at how we manage someone who develops renal impairment after starting ART. What could be causing it? How do we manage it? As for in the first case, you should be looking at the history and exam to ensure there's no causes of an AKI. But in that history, an important nephrotoxin that we need to consider is the fact that she was recently started on tenofovir. Um, so let's quickly talk about tenofovir and related nephrotoxicity. So the major route of elimination of tenofovir is through the kidneys by filtration and tubular secretion, and its clearance is in the proximal tubule. Um, higher tenofovir plasma levels result in accumulation in these proximal tubular cells, and there's a risk of toxicity in these cells. So this damage to the proximal tubule can result in acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, or partial or complete Fanconi syndrome. The risk of kidney toxicity from TDF varies across different studies, but it ranges from 2 to 10%. Um, the main risk factors for TDF nephrotoxicity include pre-existing renal impairment, older age, low body weight, advanced HIV disease, comorbidities, especially diabetes and hypertension, and concomitant use of uh, nephrotoxic drugs and protease inhibitors. So just a note on Fanconi syndrome. This is a syndrome characterized by global proximal tubular dysfunction. The proximal tubule, as you can see in this little image, um, usually functions in reabsorbing your phosphates, your glucose, your bicarb, and your amino acids. So when you get dysfunction in, your, in this area of the tubules, you get low phosphate in the blood and high phosphate in the urine, so hyperphosphatemia and phosphate urea. Um, you can get the phosphate changes just isolated, or you can also get it with glucose in the urine, like um, glycosuria with a normal serum glucose, and you can get tubular proteinuria, amino acid urea, and renal tubular acidosis. So how do we diagnose uh, TDF nephrotoxicity? The reason we do the cusp at three months um, is to pick up any changes in renal function after starting to not that. So this should be your first clue if you see a change in the renal function at three months. Unfortunately, there are no lab investigations that definitively diagnose nephrotoxicity. 
but investigating whether there is proximal tubular dysfunction can be suggestive of TDF nephrotoxicity. The aim of these investigations is to try to differentiate um, between glomerular and tubular dysfunction, because glomerular dysfunction is what we spoke about in the previous case. It's more likely to be due to um, something like high van and chronic diseases, but drug toxicity shows um, typically tubular dysfunction. So your investigations can include um, serum urea, electrolytes, creatinine, and EGFR. Um, a serum calcium, magnesium, and phosphate, you'll see a low phosphate, um, urine, phosphate, and urea, if possible, to get a fractional excretion of phosphate, because this is more specific to the proximal tubule, and you will see a high phosphate in the urine if there's tubular dysfunction. You also do a spot urine protein to creatinine ratio, um, and then you can do a urine dipstick for glycosuria. So how do we move forward in this case? Firstly, we need to stop the tenofovir. Regardless of whether at this point we're sure or not about the diagnosis, the EGFR has dropped below 50, and so tenofovir must be changed to avoid worsening of the renal function. In this patient, her EGFR was 44, so if we think back to our dosing chart, we will change her to ALD, the fixed dose combination. You should, again, just correct any correctables, adjust other medication doses, and ensure there's no uh, AKI going on as well. And then along with the investigations we just mentioned, you can repeat the EGFR monthly and um, for three months at least. So after changing the ALD in this patient, she came back to um, the next month to review her repeat cusp and her investigations, some of which I have shown here. Her cusp is now improved to 58. Her phosphate is a bit low at 0.6. Her dipstick was NAD and her urine PCR showed normal to mild increased proteinuria at 0.016. So based on review of your EGFR trend and investigations, at this point, you can decide if you think tenofovir toxicity is likely or not. Um, like in this case, the um, EGFR recovered and there's this low phosphate that could indicate tubular dysfunction. If you suspect nephrotoxicity, you um, continue on the renal-friendly regimen and you never reintroduce tenofovir. Um, so here, for example, her EGFR is now back above 50. So based on the charting, you could introduce um, TLD, but because we're suspecting tenofovir nephrotoxicity, you must keep her on the ALD. Um, if on review you suspect that it actually maybe wasn't tenofovir related, you can consider moving back to TLD one to three months after your EGFR normalizes. So now, um, what do we do about this low phosphate that we've picked up from this um, nephrotoxicity? So with TDF, um, it can cause an isolated hyperphosphatemia, um, meaning that there's no other issues, the kidney function remains normal or you can see hyperphosphatemia related to the nephrotoxicity. It was initially suspected that the isolated hyperphosphatemia was a precursor to the nephrotoxicity, but the studies are inconclusive. And so we are not using hyperphosphatemia as a precursor to predict nephrotoxicity. Um, hyperphosphatemia uh, can be asymptomatic and, or it can cause um, symptoms of muscle weakness. But the HIV clinician's guidelines say that tenofovir-induced hyperphosphatemia has not been associated with increased risk of fractures. So because of these two reasons, there is no role to routinely monitor phosphates in patients who are on TLD. Um, if isolated hyperphosphatemia is picked up um, and the patient is asymptomatic, tenofovir can be continued. So this is if the renal function is normal, but you found that there's low phosphate. You can continue tenofovir. Um, and you monitor the renal function. If they, if a patient is on a tenofovir-based regimen and they are symptomatic of um, hyperphosphatemia, you can test for it, and it's ideal to change the drug then. But it's only you only change tenofovir if they are symptomatic. And um, if they are, if you have to continue with a tenofovir-based regimen, then they say you can consider replacing the phosphate. So now we are on to our final case. So this is a 62-year-old female, BMI of 32. Um, she's known with type 2 diabetes, hypertensive disease, and dyslipidemia. She's been on TLD1 treatment for more than 10 years, and her viral load has always been suppressed. 
Um, her diabetic control has been challenging. Her metformin um, dose is 500 milligrams BD, and she's on atropine 24 units and 12 units. Um, and her HbA1c is 9.6, so she is above our target. Um, her total cholesterol is 5.2, and her LDL was 1.01. Here is a summary just of her blood results and urine tests over the last few months. So you can see nine months ago, her EGFR was slightly decreased at 58. Six months ago, it dropped slightly to 54, and her UPCR was 0.023 grams per millimole. Three months ago, it came up a bit to 55, and then currently her EGFR is 46, and her urine PCR is 0.019 grams per millimole. Based on this, she has chronic kidney disease, with her EGFR being below 60 for more than three months, and having persistent proteinuria as well for more than three months. Um, based on this history, it seems that uh, CKD is unlikely to be secondary to the HIV itself, like in our first case, and it's also unlikely to be secondary to tenofovir, um, as she's been suppressed on TLD with no prior issues of kidney disease um, or renal impairment, sorry, being reported when she started on her regimen. Um, her CKD is likely secondary to her comorbidities, especially the uncontrolled diabetes. So here is a table from SEMSTA 2017, which shows some of the features that you can look out for that might favor a diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease versus alternative renal diagnosis. So some of the things that might point you to diabetic kidney disease is persistent albuminuria, land urinary sediments, slow progression of disease, kind of like we saw in this patient where the EGFR stays similar but slowly decreases. Um, other complications of diabetes pres present, so you should be um, screening the patient for retinopathy, um, peripheral vascular disease, um, and peripheral neuropathy. Um, and also having a known duration of diabetes more than five years increases that chance. And then some of the features on the other side would be more suggestive of another cause of the chronic kidney disease. So now how do we manage HIV in the face of chronic kidney disease? So we've spoken already about the definition of CKD. Just as a reminder, what we use here is typically an EGFR less than 60 for more than three months or um, persistent proteinuria for more than six months or albuminuria. Um, so let's chat quickly about the staging for CKD. Um, one should stage CKD on three criteria. Firstly, looking for your cause. And secondly, the EGFR. And thirdly, the albuminuria. This is the staging from k to go guidelines, which shows the staging based on EGFR and albuminuria, giving you a risk stratification. You get a um, stage based on this, and this really helps us to risk stratify for complications of CKD, and it also helps us to monitor progression of disease. So as you can see here, the area in the green blocks, those are patients who have um, uh, EGFR above 60, and they have mildly increased um, albuminuria. In these patients, if you have no other markers of kidney disease, then they assessed as not having chronic kidney disease. Then there's the yellow area, which has moder moderately increased risk, the orange area, which is high risk, and the red area, which is very high risk. Um, just a reminder, again, lab track is going to give you a urine PCR in grams per millimole, and it's a urine PCR. So when you're using this chart, you must make sure that you're converting to the UPCR um, uh, different, um, what do you call it? Values. values, yeah. The UPCR values and also converting to milligrams per millimole instead of grams per millimole. Um, okay, so how do we move forward in this case? So the first thing is we need to adjust the um, HIV treatment according to her EGFR. So our patient her EGFR currently is 46. So again, we are going to be starting on ALD for this patient. Um, the next and the most important thing is going to be improving the diabetic control. So for this patient, the target should be around 7% for the HbA1c. And ideally, we should be quite aggressive in our management of this to prevent progression of the CKD. Um, the next is managing hypertension. So she does have hypertension as well. Um, we can look at uh, what medication she's on for it because the first choice in um, diabetic uh, kidney disease, if they also have hypertension, is to treat with the ACE inhibitor or an ARB, especially if they have protein urea. Um, you should assess your cardiovascular risk and treat with the statin as appropriate. 
Um, and if they have severe albuminuria, you should be treating regardless with an ACE inhibitor, R, or SGL2 inhibitor. So that's even if they didn't have hypertension, but they have severe albuminuria. And um, then we should be monitoring our EGFR, our UPCR, and HbA1c three to six monthly to monitor diabetic control and CKD progression. Just a note again, um, in moving forward, we must assess for target organ damage and refer appropriately if she needs further assessment. Um, an important thing, specifically in this case with diabetes and CKD, is that you need to be dose adjusting your oral agents as well as your insulin according to your EGFR. So that's something that you should be assessing on each of your visits. And you can see here in this um, diagram, we have metformin, glimepiride, and um, insulin, and how you adjust them according to EGFR. So our patient now comes in for review with her next, next cusp results. Her EGFR is back above 50, it's 56. Um, so now the question comes, should we change her back to TLD? because her EGFR is above 50, should we be changing her back? If we look back at her trend of her renal function, it has been fluctuating quite a lot, and it goes above and below 50. So because ALD now, we have access to a fixed dose combination, and it is trying to be as effective as TLD, and it's as convenient, it's fair to, in this case, leave her on the ALD to be on the safe side to give her room for the kidney function to fluctuate. Thank you for listening. These are just some of the references that were used for this talk. Thank you very much. That was an excellent preparation and I can see a lot of work has gone into that. And I think that's really helped to look at these very, very common scenarios that we are seeing. And we actually live in, moving into a different phase of HIV. So when I first saw an HIV Madison, it was all about high van and managing patients presenting with AIDS and, and very bad kidneys. But we're now actually moving into a phase where you've got patients who's been on HIV treatment for many, many years, and you're managing their diabetes and their hypertension. And we're seeing a lot of people now with comorbid disease, the CKD not necessarily even caused by their HIV, but caused by their other comorbid diseases. And we must be able to manage these patients um, better. One of the things I just want to highlight again um, is the fact that in the recent HIV Clinician Society guidelines, they have emphasized that we can now use that lamivudine right down to GFRs of 30, which is important because it means you can use the ALD, the one single um, fixed dose tablet ALD for GFRs 30 and above, which is making a huge difference. So you actually need to look out for those patients who has been on reduced dosing because of low GFRs and change them to the to the fixed dose combinations. Um, so um, I'm going to open the floor for some questions and discussion. I'm interested to hear from the district if you guys now have access to the single dose ALD. I know we have it here at CMH, but I'm not yet sure if that's available in the clinics. Um, can I ask if there's anybody here in the family medicine boardroom that would like to uh, have a question or a comment? You can you can come forward to talk into our microphone. Um, if you are online and you have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can put your hand up. And please remember to put your names and um, professional numbers um, into the into the the chat. Um, and I see Dr. Nash has confirmed that they do have ALD in the clinics. So I would really encourage our nurses just to, to keep an eye on those. Um, and I assume then ALD would be available on CCMDD as well. So that can also make things easier for our patients. Uh, Come and emphasize a few things, please. And they, because remember, these patients, these patients have got outside of HIV, they are like every other patient. So, when they develop, uh, they're not getting that. Dr. So Dr. Kotze is just going to give us, um, Dr. Kotze did an excellent presentation um, on Wednesday on chronic kidney disease in our HIV negative patients, and she's just going to bring a few additional comments. 
And hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think one of my additional comments that came out in our meeting the other day um, was to emphasize the chronicity of the chronic kidney disease. Um, you know, as patients don't always understand the term chronic, um, to explain that their kidneys are likely not uh, to return to their normal function. Um, and sometimes they think if you change the tablets that it will improve. Um, and that is not the case. And also just to emphasize um, some of the risks um, mentioned with that heat map from the KDGO, um, some of the risks in, involved with e worsening kidney functions include um, just general uh, all-cause mortality um, and other risks uh, increased or cardiovascular risk. So um, it's also seen as a, a yeah, a cardiovascular risk equivalent. So um, it is really quite significant to have a, a chronic kidney disease as it increases your cardiovascular like risk of mortality as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Kotze. Um, and then we have Dr. Nong here, who is also one of our medical officers and give some contributions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I think Dr. Smith gave a very nice presentation, very comprehensive, and myself, I've actually learned a lot from it. Um, just to add a few things on um, CKD, it's not just about the medical treatment. We also need to keep in mind the other things, the lifestyle things. So, uh, for instance, things like um, exercise, it is recommended that um, patients should have at least 100 minutes, 150 minutes minutes of exercise per week or up to their maximum tolerated exercise level. And then um, in terms of diet also, we need to remember things like um, restricting salt intake. Um, they say uh, to a sodium of not more than two grams a day, which is a little less than a teaspoon um, of salt. Um, we need to consider sending those patients to dietitians um, so that they can give better advice regarding what they should eat because they mention, um, KDGO mentions um, having a low phosphate diet, a high calcium diet, and then also just um, having a protein restriction, which doesn't mean that um, patients should not um, eat protein at all, but rather we should keep um, the protein to a minimum. They mention a protein level of 0 0.8 milligrams per kg per day to 1.3 per kg per day. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Nong. Dr. Adonai? Thanks for the brilliant presentation. Uh, mine is just to re-emphasize the importance of prevention of renal health of these patients. We know that we, the advent of more better, more efficacious and better tolerated medications they, they, we've been able to keep all our patients to live longer. And the implication is that with increase in aging, uh, all the other comorbidities tend to set in. And the implication thereof is that patients, as they visit the prepaces uh, level, we need to continuously reemphasize screening for uh, comorbidities, especially diabetes and hypertension, and by implication, we need to then screen for the uh, for for dyslipidemia in our patient, and for those who have got abnormalities, the priority thereof is that we need to then manage these hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia should be treated to target so that the kidney function can be maintained in our patient. That is the first point for us to think of the epidemiological link of aging and comorbidities we, in the patients who are now living longer with HIV. That is the first point I want to re-emphasize. But the other point is critical in terms of the medications we are giving patients. We do renal functions with uh, baseline and the results needs to be reviewed as promptly and acted upon. Otherwise, we'll just be wasting resources and 
patient will not benefit in benefit after pulling blood of these patients. Again, at three months, when you do repeat uh, uh, creatinine, you want to equally make sure that you have reviewed and act on the result because often than not, that is usually one of the missing or leakages in our practice that needs to be tightened up. And also the especially for our young men, young patient, uh, male patients, the tendency for people not to or to take a break or what to call pill fatigue uh, is well documented. And often than not, these patients uh, would they then return back to care only when they are now in advanced stage. And therefore, even though HIV and, and uh, the latest cause in IVAC, you know, and of course, uh, hemolytic uretmic syndrome, you know, all of these additional more serious conditions can then become a problem. And men, young men tend to drop their medications after they get better initially. And we need to constantly, re you know, reiterate, enhance and adherence, adherence uh, practice, you know, for these patients so that at least we can keep them uh, on their treatment. And by doing so, the other medications that our patients are exposed to, like Bactrim, acute tubular necrosis, as well as uh, acute interstitial nephritis, are common features that you can see even with Bactrim in itself. And often they are not, the tendency is therefore for us to be able to screen for and monitor our patients uh, closely so that if they are the advent of any abnormalities in their, uh, in their renal function, we can act swiftly on them. The few patients who may be exposed to amphotericin B, and thank God no patient will now be on canamycin anymore. These are very, very nephro you know, terrible ne uh, nephrotoxic drugs. Again, those ones should not, will not be uh, managed at the district uh, district or PAC level. Therefore, we'll then be able to, to protect those patients from uh, having deterioration in their renal function. But I think uh, we need to continuously emphasize if people with HIV, the only difference is their positive result. Therefore, all the other causes of acute renal failure, such as your diarrhea, your vomiting, who will come to PSA level, should be aggressively managed. Because as long as there is continuous volume depletion, pre-renal failure will progress to, you know, acute uh, AKI will progress to uh, CKD, if not properly managed. And the first point of call are usually at the PHC level. So please, just for us to re-emphasize, managing the area, managing vomiting, patients who suffer burns, you know, or those who are very edematous, those needs uh, aggressive uh, approach in terms of management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adene. Um, just lastly, if there's any more questions or comments from the district. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. That was a, oh, look, and I has got up. Yes, Dr. Mondonde. No, Dr. Mondonde. Yes, oh, hi, hi. go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to, to actually comment about the pregnancy, especially postpartum, uh, the preeclamptive go back and they are looked after in the districts. So we just want to emphasize the importance of the follow-up for those patients with preeclampsia. Sometimes they have renal failure and then sometimes they have persistent proteinuria. So what we would like is that it's only at the end of six weeks that a decision is made that this is persistent. So this was just preeclampsia or they've got now persistent disease. And whenever then the patient has a, a positive protein on their dipsticks, so, I mean, in pregnancy, we will look at the protein creatinine ratios of more than 0 0.03. And then if then uh, at six weeks on the six-week visit, then we need to ensure that they have no protein. Those patients that still have protein or that still have an abnormality, they need to warrant that a renal function is repeated and then they need to be referred back to physicians for further workup, you know, for all the other problems that could have been causing the the renal failure, which will also include things like a renal biopsy. And then just also just to emphasize the issue of the drugs, you know, in the patients who are pregnant, whether they had renal failure or not, we want to make sure that uh, we, at four weeks post-pregnancy, we stop the drugs if the BPs are well controlled. And then if they are not, then if they are well controlled, then they will treat drugs, we stepwise remove one drug. Our drug of choice is enalapril, we add amylodipine. 
But if they were on more than two two drugs, you stepwise one drug a week, one drug a week, and then you watch. Then at six weeks, if the blood pressures are normal, then people go off all the treatment. And um, if they, they then the the blood pressures are still high, then you put paper on another uh, And also the ones with the renal failure, we we also have problems when they also develop preeclampsia. And to know that, you know, our target of deli for delivery is one twenty for creatinine. Uh, in pregnancy, but in the patients who have underlying renal disease, we normally go as far as 250. But I think it's important just to flag, you know, those patients and send them to to high risk for further management if you see those treatments uh, in the pregnant ones, even if they were But Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mondondo. And um, yes, I also want to emphasize, um, Doc, Dr. Smith did mention that when you are evaluating the renal function of pregnant woman is to remember that we do not use the formulas. So you cannot use your EKI or your MDRD formula. You have to look at the absolute creatinine level. Um, and we need that to be under 85 in our pregnant woman. And if you do have pregnant women that have any proteinuria or any reduction um, or any increase of that urine creatinine, they do need to be referred um, and um, urgently and to not to not sit on those patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Mondondo, for reminding us on our, on our pregnant woman as well. Any last comments? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely Friday and a lovely weekend. Um, and we'll see you again in a month's time.